Hello, hello, and welcome to BSB Must Reads. I am so excited to introduce you to Bold Strokes Books' latest in online marketing, BSB Must Reads. So you might be asking yourself, what is BSB Must Reads? Well, we have one author, one book, and one fantastic reading for you from our lineup of new releases for all the rest of the month. Every few days, we'll be releasing a new video for you. So all month long, you get to hear from our amazing authors reading from their fabulous books. So first up, I have Jane Colvin reading from The Haunted Heart. Hi, Jane. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure, welcome. So this is your third book, right? Yes. Awesome. I feel like number three is where you're no longer in newbie status. You know, you're firmly established in your authorship. Um, how are you feeling about kind of being an author at book three? I feel like um, in many ways, this one was easier to write because like I kind of found my groove. And, um, but at the same time, I do still feel a little bit like a newbie because all my other books are uh, F slash NB. <laughs> and this one is um, just femme. So it's it's two women, and I haven't done that before. So in some ways, I do still feel like a new author. For sure. Awesome. Well, I cannot wait to hear all about it. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about you, about your book, and then launch into your reading whenever you're ready. Yeah. So um, I'm Jane Colvin, and my book is called The Haunted Heart. It's a contemporary paranormal romance between two women, uh, Kara and Nisha. Nisha used to live in an apartment and she had a horrible fight with her girlfriend and lost her engagement ring. And Kara moves in and they discover each other because Nisha asks Kara to help her find the ring. And it turns out there's a ghost living in the apartment and the ghost is the one hiding the ring. Now in the scene that I'm going to read today, um, Nisha has decided that after many years of pining over this ex-girlfriend, it's time to start dating again. And she's really nervous, so she asked Kara to come along and do a blind double date with her. But Kara has kind of started to feel something for Nisha. So for her, this is totally a fake date, and she doesn't really want to be there at all. The restaurant in Roscoe Village was bustling, and they had to cluster in the entryway while servers moved around them and more diners kept pushing their way in the door. It wasn't the best environment for meeting new people, and when their dates, Sarah and Jill, arrived, they could only manage half waves in the crowd. To make room for them, Nisha leaned back against Kara, who was pressed tight against a window. She put a hand on Nisha's hip to warn her not to step on her toes. Which one's mine, she murmured into Nisha's hair. It smelled like oranges and coconut. Jill, Nisha craned her head to be heard and her breath tickled Kara's nose. Jill heard her name and raised her eyebrows in expectation. Kara gave a polite smile. Jill was what Kara would call a high maintenance super femme. Although it was winter in Illinois, she was tan and not from having recently been in the tropics, if the slight orange cast was any indication. She had thick fake eyelashes that feathered out from her brown eyes and accentuated her high cheekbones. Her lips were filled with collagen, the kind of lips that always look like they've been stung by a bee and made Kara feel squeamish to look at. Her skin was flawless, but that was because she was, she paved it in foundation and concealer. Nisha wore a lot of makeup, but Kara could never actually see the layers of it caked into her skin like Jill's. Jill looked like she was trying too hard. She looked too artificial. She didn't do anything for Kara. When the hostess called Nisha's name, the four of them moved like a less than enthusiastic conga line through the crowded restaurant to their table. Kara and Nisha accidentally sat opposite each other, but Jill and Sarah took the two empty chairs before Kara could move. Realizing their mistake, Nisha raised her eyebrows across the table at Kara, who shrugged back at her. This way, she could still get to look at Nisha. She was way less bacon bake, less injected lips, less hair product much nicer to look at over dinner. Sarah suggested ordering a bottle of wine because it would be cheaper than each of them ordering two glasses individually. 
the bottom might be more practical, but Kara didn't like Nisha's date going for something just because it was cheaper or assuming everyone was going to drink two glasses. Something about her immediately put Kara on alert. Jill, by contrast, readily agreed to the wine suggestion. She seemed like one of those self-proclaimed social drinkers who swore they never drank, except when they were out, which was all the damn time. And when they were out all the damn time, they drank too much. Jill voted, uh, Kara voted Jill most likely to get wasted. Nisha hesitated at the bottle suggestion before agreeing. Kara supposed if they ordered a bottle, she didn't have to pick out her own wine or face the embarrassment of asking Nisha to do it for her. Whatever you decide is fine with me, she said to Sarah. Next to her, Jill beamed at her agreeability. The appetizer also caused a group discussion that ended in Kara saying, whatever you decide is fine. The pretend date was quickly turning into a battleground and she was losing turf inch by inch. She didn't join in the eating of the caramelized onion and wild mushroom crostini, and she internally groused the whole time about how she'd no doubt be expected to cough up for it anyway. Nisha ate, delicately, like she was worried about cramming the whole thing in her mouth the way Sarah did, or getting crumbs everywhere the way Jill did. There really wasn't a way to eat flaky toast without looking a little like an ass, unless you were Nisha, apparently. Sarah suggested splitting two entrees and that was a line too far. It might be easiest if we each order our own, Kara said, hoping she sounded disarming. That way we don't have to waste a lot of time trying to agree on something. That was what she said aloud. The internal dialogue was something like, order your own damn meal, you cheapskate. Are you afraid of eating? Over their entrees, the conversation covered mundane topics, work, Jill managed a specialty pet boutique on Armitage. The weather, Sarah had heard more snow was coming. And then the news. They all agreed the latest military intervention in the Middle East was cause for concern, but to Kara's annoyance, no one seemed capable of saying anything more specific. When Sarah asked Jill to talk more about all natural dog birthday cakes, Kara excused herself to the restroom. Nisha came in while she was washing her hands. Jill's pretty. She's all right. Nisha leaned against the countertop near Kara. Sarah's not bad. She's kind of taking the lead and making everything easy. To herself, Kara thought, if you find overbearing freaks attractive. But aloud, she said, uh-huh. What do you think we should do after we get the check? Should we go for coffee or something? This night was important to Nisha. If Kara's sour mood spoiled it, that wouldn't be fair to her. She gave Nisha a little hip check. Depends on what you want. You want to split up so you can have time alone with Sarah? Nisha's eyes grew in size. Kara? We said she wasn't bad. Nisha's cheeks were turning pink. I think my standard is a little higher than not bad. Unless you wanted time alone with Jill. Kara was too stupefied by the suggestion to respond. Jill was awful. In no universe did she want time alone with Jill. Nisha's jewelry reflected the light in the bathroom. Her eyes were wide, her eyebrows raised. Everything about how stunning she looked, how expectant, made Kara want to kiss her, to feel the touch of Nisha's silken lips against her own. And as she looked at her, Kara knew the problem wasn't Jill. It was that Jill wasn't Nisha. Aww. <laughs> I love that. And I can also commiserate on first dates because it really is hard to know what to order. I don't know. I've never <laughs> run into that problem. It's like you can't get spaghetti. You can't get bread. What do you eat? There's no carbs on the menu. <laughs> um, all right. So this is not just your first sapphic book, but also your first paranormal. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So what was that like writing a paranormal for the first time where you got to kind of twist reality a little? That was super fun. Um, I think for me, the challenge was how can I take paranormal and like, I didn't want it to be spooky. I mean, the first chapter is a little spooky because we don't yet know, you know, what's going on in the apartment, but I wanted to make it like funny and ridiculous and just sort of embrace like maybe there are things we don't understand about the universe but they don't have to be scary they just need to be things that were 
looking for an explanation for. And once we have those explanations, it's like, wow, the universe is actually just a really strange place, not necessarily a scary place. So for me, it was like, I wanted to write something that had a sort of lightness to it rather than like things going bump in the night and terrifying you. <laughs> We're like Casper sure. the Friendly Ghost, right? Yeah. More like magical realism than, you know, kind of paranormal horror for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And I think it works well with your style too, because you can weave humor around um, that really well too. Yeah, the ghost is actually my favorite character because she is, she's the comedic character. I mean, she's just totally ridiculous. I, I love that about secondary characters, especially when they're almost primary characters like Barb, because they're not as much work. Like they don't have the same kind of character arc. So they get to be your, your comedic relief. Um, and I think you totally pulled that off in this one. So your characters, um, Nisha and Kara, I would say they have like complementary goals. You know, Nisha wants to get this ring back and she thinks that our resident ghost, Barb, um, can help her with that. And Kara kind of wants to send Barb back <laughs> from mm -hmm. whence she came. Um, but they're very different people for sure. Um, and they cause each other a lot of kind of angst and frustration um, due to their different personalities. What was that like writing two characters who are so different? Was it fun because of all the tension or did you struggle to actually get them to fall in love? That's a great question. Um, I think for me, they were in love way before either of them realized it. So I think the, the tension was um, not to get them to fall in love, but how do you make people who are very diametrically opposed and how they see the universe, um, how do they recognize something that we all already recognize, right? Like I think in the scene that I read, it's so clear, like they sit next to each other at the restaurant, you know, they're, they're on a date and then there's two other people, but they don't know that yet, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think the challenge was like, how do you get people who are so different from each other? They don't even fully understand their own friendship to realize like what is so patently obvious to everyone else around them. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal of like figuring out why this ghost is haunting the apartment becomes this driving force that helps them, you know, like the partly is because the ghost is there because of them. Um, but I don't want to give too much away on that. But but also because it gives them something to work toward together. And the more they have to sort of work on like, why is there a ghost? What do we do with a ghost? Um, it forces them to spend time together and see like, oh, actually, even though we're really different, like we get along really, really well. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's kind of an interesting balance, I think, like you were saying between your characters not, not, realizing how they feel about each other but your audience and your readership understanding it the way that you do and how do you balance those two aspects without um kind of making it unrealistic um and I think you've totally pulled that off it's not easy to do um so I love it um so okay you have these two very different characters um I would say Kara is kind of more the practical um one which do you relate to the most? Which character is most like you? Oh, that's such a great question. You know, I think that every paranormal, every fantasy, every sci-fi book needs the one skeptic and the one believer, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I just think that's a good um, balance. And in this book, Nisha is the one who's really in touch with her spiritual side. You know, she practices yoga, she meditates. She just thinks that the universe is this magical place. And Kara is an attorney. So she's trained to like, everything needs to be in fine print. It needs to be spelled out, it needs to be logical. Um, and at first I was very much Kara. Uh, and the farther I got into exploring who Nisha was, I was like, actually I'm Nisha. So I think, and I hope readers will feel the same way. Like, I think that we can all sort of see bits and pieces of ourselves in both of them because none of us are like wholly a believer or wholly a skeptic, you know? it's always sort of circumstantial and it depends on who else we're around. For sure. I love that. And I think a lot of authors say that too about their characters. There's little bits of themselves um, in all their characters, but yeah. I also like the insight that it gives, gives readers into you, the author, in terms of, you know, which one um, are you most like? And I love that you changed your mind halfway through. 
um, kind of you thought you were more like here or that's kind of the way that you perceived yourself. But then over time, um, it turns out that maybe, you know, it's not not quite what you expected. Um, so awesome. So you've written, you mentioned in the um, intro that your previous two books um, had non-binary characters. Um, and this one is, um, is a sapphic romance to women. Um, so my question for you is why LGBTQ? Um, it seems like you have a passion for writing across that spectrum um, and in different kinds of genres, different kinds of stories, kind of with your trademark humor throughout all of them. Um, what is that? What is it that motivates you to write LGBTQ books? I feel like I always give the same answer to this to questions like this. Um, I mean, I'm just writing about the world I know, mm -hmm. you know, and in my world, um, people don't segregate in terms of being lesbian and people don't segregate in terms of being only in camps of trans and non-binary people. You know, the people in my community are both. And um, I feel like I just want to write about the kinds of people I know and the relationships that I know. And then in terms of like, why write it all? Um, I think that, you know, romance and mystery and like genre fictions, they get so sort of denigrated in popular discourse. I think, oh, those are like beach reads or like trash novels. But I think like the fact that they are so consumed and that especially romance, it always has a happy ending, right? Mm -hmm. You read a romance because it makes you feel good at the end. And I think our community goes through so much, um, especially trans and non-binary people. And having books that make us feel good about who we are, I just, I think that is more than just entertainment. It's more than just writing literature. I think it's actually like participating in social justice in a way. It's like asserting our right to be here and our right to happiness. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, having your voice and sharing it with, um, with those who really need to hear it. That's awesome. Um, so, okay, for readers who have read your previous books, what is something um, new that they're going to find in this new one, The Haunted Heart, um, that they may not be expecting? Kind of aside from the obvious that it's sapphic and that it's paranormal. Mm -hmm. uh, what's something that is kind of new and fresh in this one? Well... Uh, this one has explicit sex. None of my what? others did. Yeah, oh my there's gosh. definitely a sex scene. <laughs> so um, I actually just recently gave a copy to my parents and I like rewrote the chapter by <laughs> hand and it's like chapter 15. Then they went home and held hands. <laughs> so there is explicit sex for people who want to read that. That's new for me. Um, what else is new? I can really only think of like what's similar. Like there's similar oh. locations and similar, I think, class divides between characters mm -hmm. is something I'm always interested in. But in this one, um, there's just a lot less angst and tension. Um, I wanted to write a character like Kara who, for whom like, she just doesn't sweat things very much. And I think a lot of my previous characters are really anxiety ridden people who just sort of worry about everything and overthink everything. And Kara's really easygoing. So, there's moments that could be really full of conflict and they just kind of fizzle away because she's like, what do I care? It's not mm -hmm. worth getting upset about. Um, and it's kind of really fun to write a character who's like that. Yeah, that's kind of aspirational. I want to be like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. That's not part of me. That's, that's <laughs> not a bit of the character that comes from me at all. <laughs> uh, so for everyone who is new to Jane Coleman books, um, my answer to kind of what is the same would be, I think your trademark humor and your voice um, is very similar throughout, which I think we got a taste of in your reading with um, kind of the internal monologue of the characters and some of the observations. Um, would you agree with that? Do you think that's something that kind of um, sets your work apart as yours? hope so. I mean, I do tend to try to write to be funny. <laughs> I don't know that it always comes off. Um, I like to balance like really heavy hitting political issues with humor. You know, that's sort of, I think, my trademark. So in this book, um, the ghost backstory takes us on this whole journey into like LGBTQ history in Chicago. And um, it's all handled, I think, pretty lightly. 
but it's like we're learning stuff about like our community along the way and I think that's that's something I definitely tried to do in my other books as well whether it was in my last book learning about what intersex is or learning what non-binary is in my first book um mm -hmm. I think it's it's useful to take books that are fun but then like use that as a springboard for just sort of reminding us all like about important issues to our community yeah for sure in a way that's so accessible to people right and entertaining too um awesome well thank you so much jane colvin um if you would like to check out jane's book it is available at the bold strokes books website uh, we will pop the link in the comments for you please do check it out and thank you so much jane thank you so much thank you